All right, I think we're on. Okay, so we're going to talk today about both a new model of cloud computing that we're sort of pushing forward as well as a new instance of it, the Massachusetts Open Cloud. So just, I know this is obvious to everybody that's here, but you know, clouds, a lot of people are asserting that, you know, they're going to have incredible economics. You can actually spin up VMs or you can spin them down. And so for the user of it, you know, you only pay for what you want. And the provider, meanwhile, has massive capacity that he can put in there where data centers are cheap, et cetera. And a lot of people believe that because of that, public clouds are going to kind of dominate the industry, that you're not going to be able to buy a computer in a decade from now. We don't believe that's true. We actually think that the current model of cloud computing, the public cloud, where you actually have a closed cloud, you can't see inside it, can't actually meet that vision. A model where a single provider is actually standing up the cloud, is gating whatever people put into the cloud, where innovation has to flow through one company or one organization, is fundamentally not going to allow for the public cloud to actually meet that goal. And today you see that technology companies are largely locked out. For them to involve themselves in the cloud means selling to one big provider, which is a huge challenge. And also, performance sensitive applications are really hard to get right on a cloud when you have no visibility into the infrastructure. And then we have sort of all the other issues that people know about of, you know, even vendor lock-in by price. Is it really more expensive to move a byte um, out of Amazon than it is to move a byte into Amazon? So we think a new model is possible. A model where not one company stands up the cloud, but a whole bunch of different companies can actually stand up different parts of the cloud. Multiple people can stand up compute, multiple people can stand up networking and storage, and they can actually be in this environment which acts as an integration lab and acts as um, a place where you can go to a diversity of offering, both competing and offering fundamentally differentiated value. Um, and when you look at this world at first, you sort of see, well, geez, you know, isn't it going to be complicated? Today I go to, you know, public cloud and I just buy a VM. And it's a really simple story. I might have two or three flavors. In here where there's different SLAs, where there's different pricing, um, where there's different characteristics and accelerators, well, you know, what, what's a user going to know? But the truth is, um, just like any complicated marketplace, what you end up getting is intermediaries. You get up applications, whether big data platforms or SaaS platforms or PaaS platforms, that actually can do the investment to look at the underlying infrastructure and find out for their customers or for the applications they're running what the right kind of environment is. So instead of having that all in the plumbing, which, by the way, becomes really complicated at the infrastructure level to build a complicated enough constraint engine that understands affinity, anti-affinity, accelerators, locality to data, um, regulatory constraints like HIPAA, instead, let's expose the pools of capacity and let people on top of that build intermediaries that go against that capacity. So that's kind of the vision of what we want to build. I'm going to run through a couple of quick examples, and I'm going to turn it over to Jan to kind of walk through the pragmatic side. So first, just kind of looking at what we do with cloud today. Instead of having one company standing up a cloud, imagine that we had a cloud with a lot of different companies participating in it. And this is kind of a cool use case. Um, a company called CommuniSpace, which is sort of a mid-sized company in Massachusetts. And you know they actually are in 150 countries. They have data streaming in from all over the world. And they say, well, we don't really know what to do with it. You know, and we could go and build an in-house data center and have vendors try to tell us what to do, but actually picking in, in that kind of environment is really difficult. So wouldn't it be cool if you know, we actually had the mass open cloud, we could actually put our data sets into it, or at least representative data sets into it, and maybe we run big hackathons on top of that data, and maybe we first figure out, okay, cool, here's an application that CommuniSpace wants to use all the time, that goes and you know, is actually giving them back real-time data on how their, their environment is working. Um, and maybe that runs on Spark, which is a really cool big data platform, and it runs on top of um, you know, a relatively small environment like um, you know, Cloud in a Box. Well, now they have visibility into that. They see what it's running on and where the performance characteristics are right, and they can actually choose to in-house that, which is great. They can use this just as an environment to test things out. But maybe there's another application which they want to run once a month. It runs on Vertica, which is a column-oriented database that requires low latency communication. So maybe the Plexi networking and a massive SGI rack of thousands of nodes. And they only run this once a month, and they get deep strategic information about it. They're not going to in-house that. 
But maybe, you know, community space isn't that happy about going and, and using a cloud over the public internet. You know, they're just not used to that environment. Well, it turns out that Juniper has a really cool solution for extending your private network from, say, Verizon for their enterprise customers into the cloud. So as far as, you know, community space is concerned, it's just an extension of the private network. Now, this is just representative, but what this is saying, this is saying like 10 companies are offering their value to one mid-sized company. They couldn't sell to it. It's the innovation of a lot of different companies providing their value through a shared cloud environment. Just briefly kind of walking through a, a few other examples, you know, cyber physical systems interacting with the real world. Um, there's a team that's kind of thinking about how can we actually do that where we could actually get a police car going from, you know, Newton to Brookline to Boston um, full speed through and turning all the lights green before them with actuators and the lights and sensors all over the city. Well, we can do some of this stuff. But first of all, the data right now is actually divided into like 10 different municipalities. So we need a common place where it all streams. So cloud kind of makes sense. But on the other side, the vendors that are controlling the actuators really want to have their own gear in the cloud. They're not going to trust to putting this inside some third party cloud where they can not actually put their own gear into it. Um, high performance computing. We already see a convergence between high performance computing and the cloud. We see that convergence happening because of things like, you know, full bisectional bandwidth networking, which is all the big public clouds are going to. And you see sort of big HPC clusters being stood up on top of these public clouds. But if we actually had an open cloud, we could do a whole lot more. You could imagine actually mixing between having HPC workloads and non-HPC workloads and moving the boundaries between them. So you know, today, most of the Elastic Clouds run at about 50% utilization. If we had the capabilities, we could drive up the utilization to like 80, 90% and get enormously better economics. Also, one of the things we're working on is get massive elasticity. So um, you can imagine getting thousands of nodes for a minute and what applications you could get through that. So for example, there's this neat runtime that a team at BU's building where you have a Linux front end node and it kind of spins out a whole pile of nodes and then collapses them away to run an application. These are all thin library OSs that can boot bare metal. And we're actually targeting this at, at, at medical imaging applications. So you have, um, today they're doing fetal medical imaging at Children's and you know, you can't tell the fetus not to move. So you end up with these really fuzzy images and people are making life and death decisions on these. Well, you can actually take this and segment the brain, have a human being go and circle the right areas and then actually do, um, do 3D reconstruction and motion correction on it. And it takes about 24 hours on a high-end machine. So it's clinically irrelevant for people making life and death decisions. Um, there's actually a team that took that, took the core part of it, and spun this out over 10,000 nodes, and were able to solve the problem in one second. So this is representative of class of applications. You know, if we could get that elasticity into our clouds, you know, and you're not going to get that by an existing vendor saying, you know, this is a use case I totally don't know that, that doesn't even exist today. But if you can actually have a community of people working on a cloud, that's the kind of thing we think we can do. Um, last one is, you know, just an example of a whole class of research things. So today, clouds are priced based on stickiness, trying to get you into the cloud and lock you into it. If you actually reflect the cost of the cloud into how things are priced, that's going to drive efficiency because now there's a relationship between what people do and what it's actually costing them. Um, and you could do things like represent the SLA and the characteristics of the application and map that to, it, to the infrastructure so you, know, you can actually drive the real price of it to be representative of the workload. And so if, for example, they could be squished, they have an incentive to be squished because they're paying less. So there's some really neat research that's being done there. Nobody can deploy that in existing cloud because it's kind of locked behind a door, stood up by one provider. You can experiment with all these models in an open cloud. And at a fundamental level, there's a ton of these research projects going on, all of which are highly academic, have no relevance to the real world because they can't do things in a real cloud. And I think a lot of people would feel, geez, that's not so different from a developer that wants to do an at scale offering, but actually can't get access to a real cloud to do it or do anything at scale. So it turns out we, we, when we actually proposed the talk, we weren't sure we could talk about
talk about it. Um, I'm going to hand over to you in a sec, Jan. But we kicked off this project, the Massachusetts Open Cloud. Uh, this shows it's, it's a joint cloud that's being stood up by the five big universities in, in Massachusetts. So uh, BU, UMass, uh, Northeastern, MIT, and Harvard um, on top of a big shared facility we've built. And it has a broad set of industries. So we've got about 16 million to 20 million in, in matching um, commitments from industry. Um, and uh, the week before last, uh, Deval Patnik stood up in front of an audience and actually announced that the Commonwealth was supporting this cloud. And uh, sorry, it was 30 seconds over. Uh, no problem. <laughs> you did very well. I need to see if I can operate this high-tech device. So, yes, I can. Excellent. So, yeah, so as Oran said, it is finally official. We were kind of scratching the curve on when we can announce it officially, which is great now. Uh, the state of Massachusetts behind the project, it's being actually located in a brand new data center in Holyoke, which I will talk in a minute about, um, which is a green data center just being built from scratch in 2012, built up in about 18 months, um, massive scale, massive opportunity opportunity to host a lot of new equipment using some really interesting technologies around cooling, for example, with chilled water loops, um, hydroelectric energy, for example. So by commercial standard, it might not be a super mega data center, but it's still very large with 15 megawatts, for example, two acres of compute space. Um, and it gives us a great environment to host a, very, a, a variety of workloads, installations, computers, equipment, etc. There's all the whole operations behind it. So Harvard University will actually operate the entire environment. So we also have people already all very, very versed on, for example, operating large scale HPC and cloud environments. And that's just sort of a picture on, well, this was the beginning in 2012. And then magically in 2013, February 2013, the data center was ready, people moved in, Harvard, BU, others, and within two months they went from ready to production workloads, which is pretty amazing for a data center to see. And this is just a look inside the data center where you see basically all the wiring coming from top, the chilled air loops, uh, uh, water loops, for example, on top. Here you see, like for example, the aisles of equipment in there today. Um, so this is a really, really cool data center for us. I thought this was actually a great statistic from last year, literally just just after they went in production in June, um, and I got this chart from uh, James Cuff uh, from Harvard, where basically they gathered statistics on how much power they, for example, consumed just for the month of June. And you see here, Harvard, for example, consumed 199 million watts just for the month of June. I would have loved to show another chart, which was kind of nice. I talked to Oran yesterday, where in July, uh, New England ISO electricity provider actually sent out a memo to all of the large power uh, consumers to conserve power because of the heat for air conditioning. And James Cuff actually tweeted a picture where he showed we shut down all our jobs in the data center and literally consumption went from, yeah, 100 million watts to zero in no time. So he actually had like this chart where you see like all the way up and suddenly like just flatlined, which is great and shows like the flexibility they have in terms of scheduling jobs and also managing the data center. But enormous growth opportunity and running at scale today. Um, and clearly OpenStack is a great technology now to utilize for what Oran explained, Massachusetts Cloud to build this sort of what we now coin this multi-landlord cloud environment where you no longer just have one installation of OpenStack, for example, and then you only have one choice of service, but have multiple services where you compose your own service from, and then you get to pick and choose based on individual properties. And OpenStack gives us a great base for this because of its openness, modular, pluggable infrastructure, already existing APIs, scales really well, for example, and a very, very vibrant community. However, there are a couple of areas, and I will go into them briefly. There was a talk yesterday um, by our partners in crime, Peter, Jay, and Brent, um, going into much more technical detail around the issues, um, what needs to get done in open sector to actually accommodate such a multi-landlord cloud. But there are a couple of areas where Today, OpenSec hasn't been designed to cater for environments where you want to pick different flavors, for example, of services. Um, 
So in an open cloud exchange, for example, you may have different instantiation of different ser of the same service. You may have multiple Novas, multiple GLANs, for example, multiple Keystones, different network providers, different SDN solutions, and you would like to pick SDN from over here, Nova from over here, for example, and combine them across different OpenStack installations. And today that's not possible because of the way, for example, OpenStack not only identifies services, but also communicates secured services, for example, also how some of the APIs are being documented or not documented. So we go through some of those issues, but fundamentally they're not like major showstoppers. We feel very confident OpenStack can cater for them, and actually one really great experience here at the summit has been starting some of the early conversations with the community and upstream. Everybody actually was very excited about the fundamental model of the cloud exchange, and everybody actually agreed it would make perfect sense, and actually Oren had a couple of really good conversations, made great headway already around a number of topics where we thought it would take much longer to convince the community to actually do something, and they said, oh no, it makes perfect sense, why not do it? So one example here is, for example, how do I pick a service where, as Oran said in his section, where now you have different offerings maybe from the same service type, a cheaper one, Bob's Bucket Byte, for example, somebody needs GPUs, you have, for example, a more mature provider offering services, but how do you find the right one, for example, how do I connect to it, for example, and today um, that's a problem. But Part of this is the goal is all to build a marketplace on top of this where you as the end user or consumer would, for example, be able to just pick services, being at storage, being a network, being at compute, and then just compose your service, build your VM, and it just uses, for example, um, the service underneath. But you can now also imagine not you just picking yourself the services, but actually having intelligence in there where you just specify, I don't know, an SLA, a cost factor you want to achieve or not, for example, um, over, uh, go over a cost factor, and then basically just build these services automatically. So this gives you enormous choice really interesting opportunities here um, and gives you again the ability to, cr to cross multiple environments. No? There we go. So, but with OpenStack, one area is, for example, um, how do you assign or how do you also make the in environment secure as you give, for example, access to an individual user to a service? Today, the assumption is once a user has access to a service, they can access everything within the environment. And you want to make sure you can actually separate these um, and therefore be able to also reach services individually. Today, for example, Nova will give you UID, and the UID is from end to end. You can't identify individual services, individual components, and that's something which, for example, would have to be broken up. Another part is securing internal communication because the assumption today in OpenStack is anything within an OpenStack installation usually is on a private internal network and the components com communicate internal, like Cinder and Nova will communicate together within the same security framework today, but in the new model with the cloud exchange, you may have Cinder in a total different environment than you have, for example, your Nova instance. So you want to make sure there is secure communication and encrypted communication. So we are looking at ways how can you, first of all, document those internal APIs or need, they need to be documented so people can actually separate these services and how can you secure, for example, the communication between these services. And that's not only Nova um, and Cinder, this could also be, for example, console access, this could be also on the SDN side, on other components. You can play this anywhere um, in the OpenStack framework here. Um, then also, how can I use untrusted services in the context where today you might request, for example, an instance um, on a Nova node and you get your Cinder volume, which means you have access to, in theory, to all of the volumes part of this uh, Nova compute node. But in this model here with the Cloud Exchange, you want to be able that whoever has access, say, to the blue disk, own, or to the blue VM, only has access to the blue disk and can't, for example, ever get to the red disk, for example, and vice versa. You want to be able to have service segregation, and again, remember, these disks could be in a different OpenStack environment, so you want to make sure that, again, it also spans cloud, spans infrastructure, and again, you don't end up in being able to subvert data, subvert VMs from other environments, for example. 
Um, encryption I mentioned earlier for the internal services, but this is now also applicable for other services today already used for storage, for example. So if you look at storage, you use iSCSI. Today the communication is not, for example, encrypted between, say, the storage backend and, for example, um, the Nova side. So we are looking at ways to what can you do to, for example, secure the storage traffic uh, between those instances, being it via VLANs, being it via other technologies. So that's another area to explore, and I think there will be a great opportunity to collaborate again on all of these with industry partners to figure out ways, what are safe ways, for example, to secure communication, not only for the storage side, but also on the networking side, for example, how do you then communicate between clouds? Um, today, again, if you use, for example, an SDN solution, the assumption is it's in the context of a single OpenStack installation, but how do you bridge, for example, multiple OpenStack installations and then get the ability to seamlessly, for example, communicate between them and maybe even move workloads between them as well. Um, that's another area we need to look at as well. And today, for example, if I just quickly go back with SDN, is today you can do this maybe with one vendor, but also how do you get multiple vendors, for example, to interoperate? So that's, I think, a really key feature of this cloud exchange is to get multiple vendors engaged and then it interoperate between them, not just within one vendor stack, but across multiple vendor stacks. So here would be kind of a list on what we see, what, where are some of the benefits, and all that leads into why, for example, we actually participate here. But one key feature clearly is open and multi-vendor environment. So today, and I can say this coming from Red Hat, is when we do certification or testing, usually we build one environment, with the vendor together, do the certification, break it down, done. But today, nobody really offers, for example, an environment where multiple vendors come together, can do cross-certification, cross-interoperability, and make sure their gear actually works together across boundaries as well. Um, you can look at, for example, now building new and innovative services around this. So you could come in, as Oren said earlier, vendors could come in and say, hey, I've got this really cool new technology. I would like to put this in this cloud environment and then offer a service and customers might gravitate toward based on the properties, being it performance, being it capabilities, being it price, for example. Um, and then also the ability to um, span across multiple diverse environments. So when we talk about cloud, usually everybody thinks about virtualization immediately. Everything is a VM, but we actually see more and more interest in, for example, blending high-performance computing into, say, an OpenStack cloud-type environment. Um, and now suddenly you have the ability to, for example, mix, mix and match workloads within the same environment, thereby, for example, driving utilization up, but also, for example, creating again new interesting opportunities here. Um, <coughs> also the ability um, to look at for example per service pricing. So today when you go into a cloud you barely get the price for a cloud, but here you might be able to pick again based on price for individual services rather than for the entire cloud. Um, and then also looking at new ways, how do you actually orchestrate and compose workloads and applications within a cloud environment? I mean, we all talk about how you can, in theory, build these multi-tier applications where a database tier runs on one side, middleware somewhere else, or middle tier somewhere else, endpoint somewhere else. Today, that's not really easily possible. Um, besides on slides, but in reality, this would give you an environment where you actually can build these environments and also get the community involved. For example, have developers explore the real use cases in a real life environment here. <coughs> And then a couple other benefits here is it's not just a technology showcase, but also, again, the ability to collaborate within a diverse environment because Today, a lot of the collaboration happens w behind the firewall, often in very small environments, um, or developers often crave to have access to real-life environments with real-life data, real-life workloads. Especially developers here today would crave to have access to a real-life OpenStack environment with real workloads, um, real fair scenarios, but without the pressure of being in a high pressure production type environment. So here you would get exposed to operational data. Um, you get, for example, maybe to build a new service in parallel, but you can again study this in real life, look at log files, look at ways, for example, to correlate events in such a highly 
diverse and complex environment, um, look at new troubleshooting technologies, because again, OpenStack now becomes very complex, as we already all know, but now imagine this would be an environment with thousands of nodes, suddenly things like event correlation, how do you actually mine log file data, becomes really, really interesting and really important. So I think there's a lot of interesting uh, opportunities here, and again, it's not owned by a single vendor, but really everybody is part of this effort and can again then participate, bring value to the table beyond all the just technology, but all the people. So I see actually a real big value here, and that's all the true for us is it's not just the technology side, but here you can build up skills, foster new skills, for example, in a real life environment where otherwise it's really hard to get people engaged, also get people, for example, to participate in the communities and build new communities around, for example, some of the projects in this cloud. Can I just yep. ask you a question? How many people here are developers? How many of you um, keep your hand up if you actually have an environment with a thousand hosts that you can actually test? <laughs> okay, so we're building a cloud and one of the developers in the room actually can do test their experiments at scale. Sorry. Yeah, no, no, that's fine. And I bet the thousand nodes installed from the gentleman who can test might be eventually half, at least half production. So it's not like you can just jump in and do stuff. So that's actually a nice way where you might just be able to carve out, for example, areas of interest and then do some explorational work. And for us, and we've started to do this, we've been working with MOC for quite a while. Um, and for us, the real interesting aspect is, again, to bring people into the environment, work with people like Jay, Peter, Ian, and, and Oran to actually get operational experience running a real cloud OpenStack environment at scale and be able then to build their skills which they can later on, for example, bring to customers. So they, can drop, they don't get dropped into customer sites like, and for them that's all new. They actually have a lot of experience just operating this, deploying this, and now you can play this further. There might be opportunities to come up with some creative internship model or whatever down the road as this scales to kind of give people the ability to kind of do on-ramping for OpenStack deployments, or even if you just want to get used to OpenStack here. Um, it also allows us to, for example, um, have support services from our side treat this environment like a real customer. So the MOC folks can call our support people like a real customer, but our support personal on the back end side gets rotated through this role, for example. So we end up in training support people also in understanding large scale cloud environments. Um, and then for us, it's also interesting to look at again, new workloads, new use cases, large scale experiments, as Oran said earlier. Um, also the ability to maybe leverage some of the other pro products we have around JBoss, like rules engines, JBoss data grid, you name it. There's a lot of opportunity, not just for us, for every vendor to actually see how is this applicable to, for example, then manage a multi-cloud environment, multi-landlord environment, um, and also the ability to do some very early testing about around new technology and hardening of new technology at scale, because all here have been at the summit all week, and if I would ask what was the number one issue, number one topic, I would bet there was probably something with an N at the beginning, uh, network and neutron, um, and this would be environment, for example, you could test stuff very early at immense scale, for example. Uh, same would be true for deployment tools. So Jay actually, Jason actually looked at some of the deployment needs for MOC around bare metal deployments in the context of high performance computing. And the good thing is here at the summit, it turns out there actually is a lot of interest on the developer side to actually solve these problems. So Jason actually went out and built this project called Haas Hardware as a Service, but it seems there might be actually an opportunity to, to make this interoperate with other technologies such as Ironic. And again, and it is a perfect example to like how do we can how can we collaborate and how can we work better together. Um, and really for summary, I'll probably give it back to Oran as well. Like what do we what he also wants to get from you in terms of collaboration and feedback. So I mean the takeaways, I want people to come and walk away. It's, we're not we're obviously this is a place where we can refine the software that we're deploying in private clouds and that's going to be a really important problem for the foreseeable future but we actually think the public cloud can be really important and when we move away from a model of a single company standing it up top to bottom and controlling and gating the innovation, but we provide an environment where multiple companies can get involved, and in doing so, that's an environment where developers can get involved, where researchers can get involved. So a kind of open cloud. 
And we define a model we call an open cloud exchange. And that model of an open cloud exchange has a variety of providers, and it also creates a marketplace for people to create intermediaries that go and consume that underlying capacity on top of it. OpenStack, you know, not developed with this in mind, developed as a multi-tenant cloud, but not a multi-landlord cloud, has got a lot of it right. It's actually pretty close. Um, but there's actually significant changes that, that we're going to need to do to enable this environment. But the neat part is, and we've seen this verified time and time again in the meetings this week, is that actually the changes are all good for OpenStack. Hardening the internal interfaces, having them go through the same rigor as external interfaces, identifying endpoints. It turns out that in our conversation around cells, they actually satisfy a bunch of what we're already doing for reasons that Rackspace had to do to uh, offer a diversity of services. Now putting them under multiple providers and taking that same model and saying, no, that's not just for Nova. We actually want to do that same thing for Cinder, and then putting that first class, you know, delegation, you know, fine-grained permissions. None of this is rocket science, but we have to actually get this in. We don't need all these changes next week to enable this model. We'll enable it service by service um, in this environment, and we don't need all the trust issues dealt with at first. Okay, for the first couple of years, um, there can be some degree of trust about people, but we want to have a cadence of putting in the features and changes we need, and most of all, we want the community to be aware of them. You know, when they're thinking about deploying services in OpenStack or doing new development in OpenStack, we want them to be really cognizant of this model in which we want to start deploying OpenStack. Um, we also, as, as Jan was saying really well, this will actually offer broad value, we think, to the community, a place where people can come in and do at-scale experiments, where we can have, for example, Brocade or Cisco set up SDN solutions alongside each other and, you know, and actually be able to evolve their offerings very, very quickly, but be doing interoperability tests between them and figure out how we can actually go to this SDN solution and this SDN solution and have a, a single tenant be able to create VMs on them and create horizontal interfaces, say, with open daylight for communication between them. Um, so we'd like to invite people to get involved. Yep. That's it. <laughs> and probably just for, for questions, if you probably can go to the microphones would be useful um, so everybody can hear the question. So. Yep, the race is on. I think you won. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> So, um, uh, I'm sorry if I missed it, but uh, I mean, how are you going to be managing federated identity or um, that kind of stuff? Are you actually going to have like one identity provider for this whole thing or are you actually going to do federated identity? And if you're going to be, it sounds like you're going to be doing like the broker model on top of possibly different <coughs> providers, but is there going to be any notion of doing federated resource management both at the infrastructure level and then also at the application level, because you're going to have all these users and teams or whatnot that will want to collaborate, but they may want to do so, um, you know, using application level tools as opposed to just the infrastructure but services. I think I count four questions there, I, but I, but I, <laughs> but I so so I, let me kind of touch roll. on them, and some of this is TBD. But the first the first point about federal identity absolutely critical requirement. Now, we can, we don't have to do that to start off with. Right. Because we can say, hey, world, trust me. You know, right. the MOC right. is the one trusted entity here, but that's the wrong answer. So we've been looking at what's going on in federated entity, and we're really excited, and we want to exploit that. Um, we didn't identify this as a, a problem because there's actually an active work going on there, but we, we, we need to actually be one of the use cases that people consider as doing that development. Um, when we start talking about um, the broker I think that we could do, so if you look at the way cells work, right, you actually have, you know, a Nova scheduler on top going to different cells mm -hmm. and doing that brokering, and that's absolutely fine when that thing understands all of the possible applications that everybody want, might want to ever do to the cloud and all the possible constraints. At least in my previous life building a cloud for another company, is that it was really hard at the infrastructure to get all that right. So our model is that yes, we can build those things under relatively simplistic models, um, and we will, and we can actually use exactly what's in Nova today to do it, for example, for Nova scheduling, we can do that. But I think that if we want to showcase diversity of things, our model is instead, let's actually demonstrate, show the pools of capacity, 
and then build this in libraries that could be incorporated to applications. So those applications that understand their own requirements can go and pick um, three of these and four of these. Can say, okay, this is my critical database. I want it to be on that highly available storage. And these are my web servers. I'll use this kind of storage. Or maybe this has to be HIPAA compliant. So they can actually make that decision. We don't think it makes sense that there should be a scheduler that understands the world. We actually want the scheduling to be moved up. Yeah, but so but there will there'll be a resource discovery issue around that such that you know, any user application can find the right things that they need to make right. the right So choice. we're actually, one of the things, uh, we didn't describe the solutions at all, all we described was the problems, but there's going to be a rich services directory that we're building in here, yeah. um, and that services directory will tell you the pools capacity, and our assumption is each of those pools are relatively large. So you have to know these services exist, yeah. but you don't have to, you know, allocate every individual node, you just say, I want to go to that kind of Nova for that kind of resource or that one yeah. for this resource. Yeah, I think you have a great sandbox, I think it's going to be, you're going to have a lot of fun. <laughs> Hi, um, I work with HPC resources for academia, for researchers. Uh, you touched very briefly on finding novel or innovative ways to integrate HPC in an OpenStack cloud environment. I'd love to hear more about that and maybe some examples. Sure. So, I mean, at one extreme, it's, you know, if you look at, say, the North Carolina VCL project, um, what they did was really cool. They ended up sort of saying, okay, this is a private cloud solution. It, it doesn't have all the bells and whistles of OpenStack, but it's been there for a long time satisfying their enterprise. And they actually bought HPC-like gear, and then they don't use OpenStack for actually the HPC applications. What they do is they use a standard scheduler, MPI, whatever, and they move the boundary between the different kinds of resources. And that's great because what it lets you do is, is drive up the utilization because there's an infinite number of HPC tasks all the time. So it actually gets much more efficiency. But, you know, the super elastic applications, like building into Glance the capability of bursting, of broadcasting an image to a thousand nodes, so I can actually deploy, like that library OS I was talking about. Um, we're already moving, we see in HPC, we see HPC for a long time has had full bisectional bandwidth networking. Well, we're actually doing that now in clouds. You know, we the class, net, uh, class, we organize our networks in a class thing, we use multiple stages of it, um, using combined networking, but it's not obvious that makes the most sense if we're moving to a fully integrated, you know, close to data center scale machine or large scale machine. So I think that, that HPC till now has been a niche in research universities, big national labs. HPC can be part of our daily lives if, you know, you have applications can burst out and get a lot of capacity very quickly. And we think that's one of the potential things we can do on a cloud. So you can support legacy by moving the boundary, but now the next thing you start thinking about is HPC applications already have to be tolerant of failures once they start moving up to massive scale. And so bringing new programming models that actually tie into the cloud is an obvious kind of thing that's going to happen. I, I don't know if you're aware of Larry Peterson's Open Cloud Initiative. Mm -hmm. um, he's got uh, like 20 internet pops with Folsom running, and um, he's looking to recruit in a bunch of Planet Lab um, nodes and racks at various different universities. Um, currently running Folsom, and um, he, it's, I think it's opencloud.net, something like that. Have you checked this out? Yep. Okay. Hi, uh, I have a question. I got in late, so the, uh, you probably already covered it, and because I read the description, and uh, uh, this is an amazing model. Uh, obviously, has a lot of great impact, you know, especially the social and the community. But on the uh, the more um, commercial and economic perspective, and I, I read something in the description that like the participants, uh, uh, especially the c companies and I guess commercial entities, can also derive their revenue somehow. So if they're like a, a common, uh, you know, kind of a federated or you know, unified uh, billing charging system, and so that people can. All leverage uh, on top of that, you know, based on, you know, the resource they contributed and then they get the, uh, you know, revenue. I don't know if that's already covered. Well, we didn't talk about it, okay. and you know, we—it's absolutely critical to this. Is where you know, for everything that's deploying OpenStack, we'll be using you know standard metering techniques, and everybody should be metering their own offering. You know, and the idea is actually you can go to the cloud, you can buy the service from who you want to, um, and the cloud, the MOC, is the thing that's going to be responsible for actually the billing. But you know, the metering of it and the determining the rates is actually what each individual company should be doing. Now, there's a lot 
that has to be evolved in the business model. The first year we're kind of offering this for free to the research universities right. with a limited access to the public. Um, but, but that's actually our three-year plan. We've promised the Commonwealth within the third year, I think, by the end of the third year, by the, sorry, the end of the second year, we'll have a model that, that we'll be implementing in the third year. So it could be something like on top of Salam term, maybe some, you know, add on other, uh, you know, vendor uh, capabilities and... Well, our basic assumption is this is all built on top of Salam term. Okay. But we've got enough problems to worry about that that's another year or so that I have to really start worrying about okay, that. Thanks. I think one more minute, one more yeah. question. Hi, uh, first of all, uh, thank you uh, very much for the interesting presentation and for the interesting topic and the question. So uh, what is the definition of the cloud in your model? Because from a first look, it looks like that you are building cloud on demand. So it looks like you have like cloud of clouds. So in this uh, model, what is the definition of well, a cloud of clouds would be a model where one person stood up OpenStack, another person stood up OpenStack, and then we did some sort of federation between them. And that's, that's not the way we envision this. This actually is probably the way it's going to start. But I want a company that understands how to actually do storage and a really cool, innovative thing, maybe Solidify or something, to come in and just do Cinder in here. Right? and actually manage it and be able to iterate on it. I want Brocade to come in and actually have a Neutron, um, maybe with, um, maybe with um, Open Daylight under it, that they're evolving really rapidly and deploying in an agile fashion on top of their switches and stuff. I want you know, EMC to be doing its storage, and I want people to be able to mix and match. So maybe HP is doing everything in one, one, one step, but I think people want to have their data come into the cloud, and then they want to be able to move from one kind of compute to another depending on the characteristics. Or they want from the same compute to be able to have storage from different things. So I think the way we think about this is take what OpenStack is today, a set of services, well-defined API. Each one is really a separate service. You know, that's kind of Amazon's mantra, is that all interactions go through the external API, right? So just harden OpenStack. And so each of these things can be stood up by a separate provider that really is focusing on their area and can innovate at their own rate and isn't dependent on all the other parts of the cloud, is, can offer their service. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, I think we're supposed to wrap up now. Thanks, guys. Okay.